Welcome back, Luke, to Blurry Creatures, the podcast where we talk about Nephilim and Genesis 6 and Bigfoot and all the weird stuff. I'm Nate Henry. And I'm Luke Rogers. We're here. <laughs> well, what a proper introduction. That's the first one. You know, my, I, I can't wait for Amy. I can't wait for my wife to listen to this because she's always like, you guys never introduce yourselves. Yeah, right. You guys just jump into it. And here we are. Introduction. <laughs> I feel like being kids of the 80s. Oh, uh, I feel like we need to run that Bulls intro music, Michael Jordan, where they turn the lights yeah. out. Oh, Jock man. Jam? Yeah, it's the whole, did you know when you hear it? It's just a, oh, yeah. you know, oh man, out in out of North Carolina. Maybe we'll Michael have to Jordan. do it on this episode. Dude, let it happen. Luke, you know, it's been crazy, but we're feeling good tonight. You and I hung out today. We had some tacos, we some sure coffee. Yep. I, uh, I, felt, I felt small in your presence, you know. I feel so tiny in your arms. <laughs> you, I, I, I'm like normally I'm the biggest guy, but when I hang out with Luke guys, I, I feel a little bit small. Like Luke's way bigger than me, so about 20 pounds bigger than I want to be as well. So as long as we're being honest here, <laughs> but I think I could still grab a re- I think I could still grab a rebound. We'll see. It's about low. Hey, low man gets the low man gets the ball, right? It's yeah, the, exactly. It's football, basketball doesn't matter. I could get a little bit. I, I, I was always up against the centers like you in, in high school. So yeah, like Charles Barkley, man, don't be the tallest. Yeah. Just gotta have, just gotta have the biggest butt. You just have the biggest bud and those those giant thighs. Well, anyway, we are happy you're here. You guys have been awesome, sending us a ton of messages last this last couple of days, dude. We've gotten so many messages from people just encouraging us to keep the show going because we've been, like we said a little bit uh, our last episode, there's just some crazy personal stuff going on in our lives. But you guys are awesome, and uh, a lot of members coming on board lately too. So if you want to become a member, Luke, how how do they become a member? It's pretty easy. You just go to the blurrycreatures.com. And you sign up to be a member, and you get all of the perks of membership, which would be you get early episodes, you get exclusive episodes. Uh, there is a super secret, a members only Facebook page where we talk about all the stuff a little more in depth. Um, we have at least right now we're doing once a month we're doing a members chat. Uh, we initially called it a happy hour, but at this point there hasn't been any margaritas involved. But we did have Dr. Laura Sanger. Uh, in the last yeah. one, and yeah. we, we bring on guests sometimes. It's not just Nate and I, and we, we just talk about things we talk about here, but we talk about it in a group discussion, a panel discussion. Sometimes it's a short lecture from a uh, from a guest. And all that stuff and more can be yours for the low, low price, Nate. Oh, of just seven, seven bucks a month. Yeah, God's number. Yeah, right. It's number yeah, of completion and perfection. So be complete and, and be perfect and be a member, right? Nate? <laughs> wow, that's that's hey, you know like some people might uh, give you some some crap about that one, but that's okay. Oh. If Tim oh. if Tim Alberino gets hate mail, we're waiting for it. You know what I mean, Timmy. So we were, we were just joking, Nate and I on uh, we were just talking on the phone before this about how people always ask when we do these episodes if, if there's video. And the new go-to is saying, oh, you know, we do videos so we can see you, but we don't record it. So you can, you know, we told Alberino and now Doug Van Dorn they need to wear a shirt. They didn't want to. And I was like, hey, this yeah. is about, a, we're, we're talking about Atlantis, Nate. And this is like, it's like a beach theme. If you want to go just, you want to be in your swim trunks, by all means. And you wear your, you, you should have brought your boogie board in and Derek, your Derek, trunks. Derek, Derek loved that. D. Olson. He loved, he loved that I had the, uh, the wind and the waves and. Oh, well, maybe I, that's maybe that'd be a good follow up, Luke. We can get we can get Derek back on and talk about the Cyclops because you know supposedly those creatures made the megaliths. They were master stonemasons. So who, who knows if they had some a hand in Atlantis as well? We'll find out. Yeah, exactly. But no, thanks guys for listening and joining the team and supporting us. Like we we pod, even if there is no bonuses for signing up, it still helps us kind of keep going, keeps the lights on and blurry creatures. So. We try to get as much bonus content as possible, but lately life has been a little wild, so bear with us. We'll be back in the flow with extra content soon. With that, let's get Doug on the show. Doug, how you doing, man? How's how's life? I am doing just awesome, man. When you get to spend a day thinking about Atlantis again, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I uh, we we've been teasing it for so many times. Uh, 
haven't we, Luke? Have we have we talked about doing it on the show? I can't remember, but I don't know. We tease it with Doug though. Every time we talk yeah. to Doug, I'm like we need to talk about Atlantis. <laughs> we haven't covered yeah. it. We haven't covered it at all, and it is it is probably the blurry continent that fits into the blurry creatures world map, right? I think it started, <laughs> Luke, is that when we our first interview with you, Doug, you said you had like six or seven books behind you all on Atlantis. So. Oh no, no, it, no, not six or seven. How many? I don't know. I was, I was looking. It's like thirty. Really? Probably. And yeah, and then you tell, and then you told us you're not an expert on it. How how can you read thirty books on it and then not consider yourself pretty well? I mean, it's been like twenty years, I suppose, since I was really reading all those books. So when did you really get into all this stuff? Uh, alternate history and you know alternate theology, I guess you could you could yeah, call it. All right. Um, well, I, here's a little timeline of Doug Van Dorn in Atlantis. So I was trying to think about this today and it all started when I first started reading books in college, like really actually reading books. I hated books before that. And I came across this textbook. One. Textbooks have a way of doing that. Yeah. Though, where you, you're they, they forced do. to read. Yeah. But you know, even, even uh, American lit and stuff, I just couldn't stand it. And a uh, hmm. roommate of mine was reading a book book by a guy named Stephen Lawhead. Have you ever heard of him? Fiction, mm, uh, historical fiction. And uh, he wrote a series on King Arthur. And the first book talks about the bard Taliesin. And he tells this story of Taliesin being kind of a miraculous birth in Britain. And then simultaneous to that, he tells a story of this Atlantis queen, Charis. And uh, they don't take place in the same timeline until they end up meeting later in the book. But that was the first time I really ever thought about Atlantis other than, you know, maybe in search of with Leonard Nimoy or something like that yeah. as a kid. And I was, I was pretty interested in it, but did never look farther into it. Then I came across Graham Hancock. So this, the Taliesin book was like early nineties, I suppose. And Graham Hancock writes his book, fingerprints of the gods mid nineties. And I think I have the second edition. So this is probably a year or two after it came out because it was such a massive hit. And that was the book that really got me started down the rabbit hole of Atlantis. His whole quest was to look for an ancient lost civilization and he ended up writing, I don't know, four books or something like that so far about that. And in this particular book, he references a, a, a book from a guy named, uh, Charles Hapgood. You, did you watch 2012, the movie? Oh, yeah. Remember the scene where Woody is in the uh, trailer and he's explaining to him earth crust displacement and all this stuff. I started oh, yeah, laughing yeah. out loud in the theater because I'm probably the only person that had ever read that stuff. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, they totally, they totally are taking the Hapgood, uh, earth crust displacement thing as the way to the mechanism for their, for the disaster in their movie. Yeah. So uh, in mm. that book, Hapgood has a bunch of maps, maps of the ancient sea kings. This is a separate book, actually, from Earth Crust. But and so Hancock's talking about how there's this ancient map that talks about Antarctica uh, that nobody had known about. And since that time, since reading that book, I've come to believe that they were both misreading the map, and then it's actually just a kind of the coastal the coast of chile in in south south america but nevertheless um right around that same time there was a guy that was writing about how atlantis was you know we we completely missed it we misread plato and it's not some tiny little island in uh the mediterranean somewhere near greece it's not out in the atlantic it's actually antarctica which is right up the Hapgood Alley where, where he's talking about how Antarctica had moved from a tropical zone down to what it is today. And this all happened in the, in the span of just a, you know, a couple of days or whatever, uh, massive catastrophe theory. So I read the, I read the book on Antarctica and Atlantis and that's what hooked me. And I just started going on Google, uh, and Amazon. I think Amazon had just come out kind of early two thousands. And I was looking up every book I could find. And I mean, I've read books about it being in uh, Cuba, in Florida, but with the Bimini Road in um, Peru, you know, in England. Uh, the, there's like a 
island supposedly fell into the ocean between England and Sweden, Norway. I think, that call, I think they call it Doggerland or something like that. So somebody wrote about that. I mean, you just got these these ideas that are everywhere. And uh, one of the one of the more recent ones, a guy has got like I don't know five million hits. The guy's name is Bright Insight, and he uh, popularized an idea that it's actually in the continent of North. Africa, actually Mauritania, in a very strange uh, natural formation called the Recot structure that looks very similar to the way that uh, Plato describes the actual city of Atlantis. So, yeah, that's going to be my journey, but I haven't looked into this for a long time. So, you guys are catching me a decade too late. <laughs> well, let's, let's open up those memory banks. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, well, Doug, I mean, so Atlantis, Nate, like this comes obviously if we're talking about the narrative that, you know, that you normally get, this is, it was written by Plato, correct? Correct, Doug? And, and, and history or the historical narrative will tell you that it's an allegory and it has to do with this antagonist to Greece and it's not a real place. But, you know, if you go through history, we find a lot of historians that, that believed it actually was a real place and that the Egyptians have have a narrative about Atlantis and the Plato actually borrowed from from them and that, that's about the extent that I know I know of this is besides what you you know besides the fact there's an Atlantis in the Bahamas with big water slides and <laughs> so I, I'm I am in a place where I'm ready for you just to drop some knowledge on this because it's okay um, like what do you think Doug I mean do, I mean it's just like do you think it's under underwater you think it's just been destroyed i mean well i mean where do we start i mean i don't know a whole lot about atlantis other than a lot of people on our show have talked i've talked about it and danced around it okay i'm kind of a rookie so you can talk to me like i don't know anything all right so let's start at the beginning i think a lot of people don't realize that atlantis actually does come from plato that's our earliest source of it so plato is what like 400 bc and mm -hmm. so this he writes about it in two books. These are some of the last works that he wrote. One is called Critias and one is called Timaeus. And uh, he describes describes it in both. And I've got some things to share from those that I think you'll find pretty interesting. I don't know when we'll get to some of it, but uh, we we definitely need to get to to certain parts of it since this is kind of a Christian podcast on it. But so the question of whether or not, first of all, is it a myth or is it uh, true history? You know, Plato writes like in the Republic and stuff about ideal cities and stuff like that. You know, he was kind of, in some ways, almost a proto-communist with with uh, a utopian version of the way that cities should work. And so, some people think that Atlantis kind of fits that idea of a utopia that it so therefore it never existed. And they they see that both in the um, almost the golden age way that he talks about how they lived in peace and all the animals were there and and even the structure of the of the main temple site uh, and the numbers of it and, and stuff like that. But here's how he actually describes it in the Timaeus, he says. So it's a dialogue between four guys and one of whose name is Critias. And Critias is talking to Socrates and he says, then listen, Socrates, to a strange tale, which is, however, certainly true. So Plato is telling us that that, you know, this is a true story. And then he explains why. He says, as Solon, who was the wisest of the seven sages, declared, he was a relative and a great friend of my great-grandfather, Dropidas, as he himself mm. says in several of his poems. And Dropidas told Critias, my grandfather, who remembered and told us. Hmm. So that's the, that's the historical background of it. And when you go and you read uh, more of the Timaeus, what you find is that he starts talking about how Solon, who, you know, he's his ancestor and apparently, actually, I, I co coincidentally just came across uh, Augustine talking about Solon, uh, this great, great grandfather of Plato living during the time of, I think, Zechariah. Um, I think it might have been a little bit earlier. So accounts put him up around 600 BC, right around the time of the destruction of uh, the temple in Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity. So he might be actually talking about, you know, a priest Zechariah or something like that rather than a prophet. Hmm. So Solon apparently travels down to Egypt and he starts meeting with the Egyptian priests and he spends like 10 years in Egypt. And over the course of time, they start 
talking to him and he starts asking questions about ancient history. And these guys say, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are always just children. You don't know your history. Hmm. We Egyptians, we have history and it goes back forever and ever. And then they start to tell him the story of Atlantis. And so Plato puts the dates of Atlantis as something like 9,000 years before his time. So that's uh, 11,600 years before our time. Uh, so like, you know, literal creationists who read the genealogies in Genesis. So that's not possible. So a lot of Christians who say that you could never have that. You get uh, Christians who might entertain the idea and certainly secular writers who will say, well, maybe he wasn't talking solar years. Maybe he was talking lunar years. And so they'll, they'll try and put the date a lot, a lot more recently, like uh, around the time of Moses actually is what one guy proposes. So you get you get different dating for it compared to what you know we actually read in the in the narrative of Doug, Plato. Doug, I want to say one thing. If if you got if we if our listeners have listened through our catalog to this point, we did a show with Derek Olson about the pyramids mm-hmm. and kind of talking about them built, and then we talked about the Sphinx. And what I think is interesting is the way that they date the Sphinx right now, or a lot of Egyptologists because of the of the rain. Right. And the water damage on it would put it right almost in that same timeline as Atlantis. They say it's about eleven thousand ish years ago, older, which means it predates all the pyramids and everything. Well, allegedly, allegedly the pyramids, right, but it's allegedly. right, it, but it's old, like real old. And they said, well, there's no, there wasn't any civilizations at that point, and now we're finding okay, like the, but there wasn't rain in the Nile Valley until that point. So <laughs> I think it's fascinating because this is lining up, right? Because that's right. What 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 they're saying with with the timing of this, according to the the Egyptians, according to the grandfather of, or the grandfather of Plato, is right in time with what we're seeing as they date the Sphinx. If if we're doing it based on water damage, which is what all the cool kids are doing now. So, and you guys just had Judd Burton on, right? Yeah, we sure did. So yeah. Judd has been working on um, a place called Gobekli Tepe, yeah, and writing a book on that. on that. And they're dating Gobekli Tepe. I think just a little earlier than than what uh, Plato is talking about Atlantis, perhaps just a tiny bit earlier than what uh, the the Sphinx seems to be dated at. And what's strange about Gobekli Tepe is that, and that's a that's a site in Turkey um, right. that they just uncovered, and they've been doing a lot of excavation on it. And uh, what's so strange about it is that they seem to have deliberately buried the place. Why mm-hmm. in the world would you do that? So, you know, the, the stories are that they had rumors that there was going to be some catastrophe coming. And so one idea is that maybe they, they buried it to preserve their knowledge or whatever. And maybe somebody would find it years later. Hmm. It's, fa- it's fascinating because this is like, it's really interesting because we, we just did two episodes ago with Judd about Gobekli Tepe, oh, okay. about, about how it may have been. And he hypothesizes it was a, a temple, a temple built to the watchers. Right. And then there's all this crazy stuff about that place as well, how it essentially all of history would have said that they, we were all hunter gatherers, we humans at that point. And then out of nowhere, it became agrarian and then there was stone hmm. megaliths. And it was just almost of this, as if there was a, 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 flip, a switch flipped. And you know, it's easy to hypothesize at that point that we see when they see the inflection of technolo- technology and knowledge that lines up with Genesis six and some, or at least that sort of um, event where you have really contact, I guess, between the watchers. And so I think this is fascinating because if it's Doug, it's like right in the, in these places that we've traveled and that we still haven't really talked about <laughs> Atlantis. But, and so, but we've also talked about Luke, like kind of how, like Judd talked about how myth is just to preserve. It just preserves the, probably the truth, the actual, it's a, tr- vessel, it's a vessel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people when they probably like when I read Plato in college, I would probably read it completely differently uh-huh. now. Oh yeah, it's not like stories, you know. They're pulling from history, you know. And I think that our listeners hopefully are at that place where they can understand that concept of like, you know, these things, these people, these places, they actually existed. You know, uh, it's not just uh, stories and and fantastical stories. So. Anyway, that's how I read it now, but much different when I was 20 years old going to college. So, Doug, I interrupted, but it's 11,000 plus years ago we have. So you think it was deliberately buried because we talked to so many guys like 
for instance, the Moai statues on Easter Island, right? They're right. completely they're completely buried. So when when most isn't there so much under the soil that we don't even know is there still to this day? And why couldn't a flood just buried all these things? You know? Yeah, I mean the Moai are, are interesting. I have no idea when they were made. They seem to be a lot more recent than Atlantis, but I don't have any idea. I mean, but you, they're like you know they're three quarters of the way buried. Yeah, that's yeah. right, and they're incredibly deep. So how in the world does yeah. that happen? Exactly. I got us. I got us on a tangent. But yeah, go ahead, Nate. You're doing a good job <laughs> putting it back. Well, it back I'm just together. thinking, like Atlantis. You know, it's probably buried too, right? Well, that's part of the myth, right? Didn't it, didn't it get swallowed by the sea? Yeah, I think the my my best recollection of this is that the Atlantis that Plato talks about was actually kind of the remnants of something that was mostly destroyed before that. Hmm. Something um, else. So, and that that kind of fits into how my timeline of it that. You know, we'll, we'll get to it at some point. I wanted to say a couple more things about the dating of it because uh, there's a guy named Randall Carlson. And I found out about Randall Carlson from uh, a podcast that Joe Rogan was doing with Graham Hancock. And then Randall Carlson was on this podcast. And this guy's a, he's a fascinating guy. He's like a, he's like a modern day Gnostic Platonist kind of a guy. <laughs> and so he's into all this. He's into all this sacred geometry and, and, but he's also a, probably the most advanced non-degreed archaeologist living on the planet. This guy's incredibly well-read in, in the peer reviewed literature and stuff like that. So he has a whole like 10 shows of podcasts dealing with how Atlantis. So one of the, probably the main, the main and first theory was that uh, Plato says that Atlantis was beyond the Straits of Gibraltar in the big ocean, the world's ocean. And so the first and main theory was that it was somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Like, and he says beyond Atlantis was the great continent. And so, you know, according to modern history, nobody could have ever known about the great continent, assuming that it's North and South America, but I don't buy that at all. In fact, I have a book called Why Columbus Was Last. <laughs> To get to North America, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, right? like everybody, everybody was over here. They, they knew all kinds of things about it. So he's not the only one that's dealing with this. There's other guys that, that have looked at catastrophe evidence from especially North America and Europe, but really it goes all across the world. And all of these dates seem to point to the same time as uh, the destruction of Atlantis. Like there was some kind of a terrible thing that happened near the end of the last ice age that was global. I mean, this is where, uh, uh, you find woolly mammoths that, you know, still have food stuck in their bellies. Like they died that quickly. Um, mm -hmm. it was a global event. And he suggests that, uh, Atlantis was, uh, destroyed and thrown into the bottom of the, of the Atlantic ocean in, in just a, a matter of hours. And that that was very plausible and that we actually have jig, uh, geological evidence that demonstrates that's the case from rock sampling and stuff like that that they've taken from it. So there would be leftovers of the island. So the island itself called Atlantis was probably about the size of Nebraska. When it was destroyed, it would have just been hardly anything left. It goes into the bottom of the ocean. But so one theory, and I think this is, to me, this is still the most plausible is that where the Canary Islands are, off the coast of Spain, you know, ways off the coast of Spain, but they're still there. And they, ha they have the remnants of, you know, this ancient civilization. There's uniqueness to the people that still live on the islands to this day. And that that could be, you know, where the remains of something that was much bigger that we'll never be able to find because it was utterly obliterated by this disaster. Hmm. What, what kind of disaster do you think that was like? So I tend to think that it was a comet that hit. Um, wow, wow. that's what the evidence seems to be. And, and, um, you know, the like reason Sodom and Gomorrah kind of thing, uh, I had Sodom and Gomorrah is a, its own thing. I think that's much more recent. Um, but Sodom and Gomorrah could have been kind of a local, a localized kind of a thing like that. This is just like a giant, this is a giant thing. deal because it's remembered in all the stories. Armageddon. You know? Yeah. Like there's so here's an example of why this is interesting. There's serpent mound effigies that are all over the world. And um, one of the ideas of what a serpent mound would be, would be a reflection of an ancient comet catastrophe. And most of these things are aligned with uh, cardinal points and the solstices and the way the sun rises and the moon rises and stuff like that. 
And um, there's one that I was watching Carlson talk about today uh, where it no longer exists except for a mound. But the thing was 10 miles long. And at the head of it was a circular structure that looks eerily similar to the way that Plato describes the city of Atlantis that Poseidon builds. And yet this is in Ohio, in North America, couldn't possibly, right, have had any contact with Plato uh, and Solon and the Egyptian priests, mm. or could they have? Mm. <laughs> I guess the reason I brought up Sodom and Gomorrah is because, like, it's destroyed because of a moral yeah. just yeah. Ish- issue. Not really, like, size or comparison, but just, like, does this comet come down and obliterate this place because of the pure evil that's basically yeah and plato plato talks about that too i mean he he, he talks about how there, it was starts as a golden age everything's peaceful and harmonious but then people go crazy and then uh the gods have to destroy it because it's so wicked and they're like atlantis is all over the world basically too we found these dynasties everywhere right yeah that's my my theory is that what you're seeing you know all so there's a reason why everybody is seeing atlantis in so many varied places it's because there was an ancient civilization that all had the same information and there might have been a couple of them so i haven't done a lot of digging into the other side of the world in the in the uh in the pacific but there's a whole a whole mythology that another continent lemuria or mu the same thing kind of happened to it a lot of people think it's the same thing the problem when you start getting especially into that one but atlantis is the same thing too is you get a lot of you get a lot of like theophysists and and uh, just almost cultic kind of people that are writing about it. So it's hard to sift through anything that that could even smack of objective science when you're trying to think about it. But you know, we're Christians. We believe that the that the world was populated before the flood, and that God wiped out the world in a flood. So why in the world wouldn't you expect to find a universal, you know, culture? that is highly technologically advanced and doing all these kinds of things. And, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't have to look like our culture, but you know, God destroyed we, it because of wickedness. We d- we've heard that on our show many times, Luke, like the mounds were built the same and they have the same math and they have all these similar traits all over the world. You see the symbolism, they find yeah. the same things when they dig up these areas. Like it, it seems like, yeah, like they were all kind of, they were all taught some sort of watcher technology and then they took it to different parts of the world. Right. You know. Well, I think too, it's fascinating when you talk about the, the, the oral tradition of, of Atlantis is that it was built by Poseidon. And if we're, if we're to ascribe to what we've talked about, Nate, um, throughout this show and the idea of the pantheon of gods was, was really like a, you know, was a counterfeit of, of the kingdom of heaven but but where we put the serpent at the top or, or Zeus and whatever you want to call him, it's 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 Satan or Apollo, and the rest are actual watchers. They were these, you know, they were the, they were the fallen angels. If that's the case, then this is then we see a super advanced civilization that was built by Poseidon, who we can assume was a watcher, right? I mean, if that we follow that line of of thinking, yeah, and I, I think that. I just think if we look at the technology and the, and the way it's described, it makes a ton of sense. It's the same idea, right? It's the same idea that we have these what would impartation you be the of knowledge. Would it be one of the offspring? All right, so let's get into this. I didn't know when when this would come up, but this is the perfect time to come up. So, all right, we're going to go into the Critias now. And this is Plato's account. And I first found this when I was writing the giant book. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. I was just, I was blown away. So, uh, you guys familiar with, I forget if I've asked you this before. Are you familiar with Michael Heiser's work? Oh, yeah. Okay. You no, know, what's funny is you've been described as, <laughs> I, I was going to say this, you've been described on our show as the perfect blend between Tim Alvarino and Mike Heiser. <laughs> <laughs> like you have, you have a lot of heart and then you, but you also have a lot of the, the, the knowledge and the, and the scholarly part of it, but you get, you have this perfect blend. I don't know if you like that, that <laughs> comparison, but. That works for me. But I like I like Gentle, a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> but, you have, but, you, a scholar. but you bring some of that heart to it. You know, you you get those. Well, I uh, love heart. this stuff. I mean, yeah. How can you how can you not how can you not love this stuff? I I've told people that when I die, first thing I want to do when I see the Lord is I want to say, "Are you having a pre-flood history class?" Because I want to be the first person <laughs> to sign up for it. <laughs> you think we'll get? Yeah. Tell me every. Tell me everything. I want to <laughs> exactly. know it all. <laughs> 
Sorry, I cut you off though. But anyway, yeah, we 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 have heard of Heiser's work because he's luckily we got him on our show. So no, oh, awesome. Yeah, we have more. Yeah, okay, so he has what's called the Deuteronomy thirty-two worldview. That's what he calls it. Yeah, and this yeah. is where the gods are divided among the nations. So this is what's so fascinating. Um, Deuteronomy thirty-two seven and eight, Moses says. You know, sit, sit down, listen up, because I'm going to tell you about the time when the whole earth was distributed according to allotment and the sons of God received their allotment, right? So <clears throat> there are, there are uh, church fathers like Justin Martyr who talk about how somehow Plato's writings seem to have had contact with a Moses, which makes a lot of sense to me because if Solon came down to Egypt and he spends 10 years there. First of all, he's living in 600 uh, BC and there's going to be all kinds of refugees from Israel that are, you know, they fled to Egypt because they're scared of what's coming from the East and Babylon. And then second of all, he could have traveled right through uh, Palestine on the way back to Greece if he wanted to go by land instead of by sea. So why in the world wouldn't he have come into contact with Mosaic writing, right? makes sense to me mm. so there's this passage in the critias and this is how it starts it's almost word for word deuteronomy 32 7 and 8 it says once upon a time the gods were taking over by lot by allotment the whole earth according to its regions uh, by just allotments each god received one of his own and they settled in their countries now, in other regions, others of the gods had their allotments and ordered their affairs. But inasmuch as Hephaestus and Athena were of like nature, born of the same father and agreeing, moreover, in their love of wisdom and craftsmanship, they both took for their joint portion this land of ours as being naturally congenial and adapted for virtue. And then he goes on and on and talks about how great Greece is because they're philosophers and you know they love wisdom and stuff then he picks up the story a little bit later and he goes like as we previously stated concerning the allotments of the gods that they portioned out the whole earth here into larger allotments and there into smaller and provided for themselves shrines and sacrifices even so poseidon took for his allotment the island of atlantis and settled therein the children whom he had begotten of a mortal woman in a region of the island of the following description. And he describes it. And he says he made circular belts of sea and land enclosing one another alternately, some greater, some smaller, two being of land, three of us by sea, which he carved as it were out of the midst of the island. And he does this because he falls in love with this human woman who he's not supposed to have. And he's trying to protect her from people that are coming, try and get her. And he could do this because there's no ships and no sailing vessels that were in existence. And so Poseidon himself sets in order with ease as a god would the central island. So he takes that and he begat five pairs of twin sons and reared them up. And when he had divided all the island of Atlantis into 10 portions, then, you know, the first king to reign comes along after him named Atlas. And then he goes on and describes more of it. So, <laughs> I mean, when I first read that, I was just blown away. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. This is literally exactly what Moses says. And now here we have not only Plato describing the gods of Greece, but he starts describing the origin of Atlantis in the very same way. So he's, he's describing um, Poseidon, who would be the son of, I think he's the son of Kronos. Uh, he's the son of a Titan, just like Zeus is. So Zeus and Hades and Poseidon are brothers. So to me, that puts him in a watcher category, but it's post-fall post-fall or not sorry not most not post-fall post-flood post-flood so then he marries a mortal woman has children they begin to reign so what would these mortal woman and watcher children be wouldn't they be nephilim i mean that's a definition of a nephilim giants all right so if yeah. if atlantis has been destroyed sometime after this that means that means that what plato's describing has to be Tower of Babel or later has to be. It can't be pre-flood because there's no allotment of the nations pre-flood. That's a Tower of Babel thing. 
That doesn't mean that there wasn't an, an Atlantis that was pre-flood that was destroyed by the flood. All that means is what he's describing is kind of this last remnant that, you know, Poseidon ends up taking this place for himself after the flood. Um, and then uh, after however long it ends up being destroyed. It's fascinating. It's like the, uh, it's the whole second incursion. It's the whole theory. second we incursion about, thing, like, isn't it? Right, mm -hmm. and so we talk about Goliath and his brothers, and where did these giants come from the second time around? Right. And you go, well, there's a narrative for that. I think it's fascinating, too, the concentric circles, right? Like we, I mean, that's something very, very Atlantean. The, circuit the idea there's there's all these circles, right? Exactly, but then you also see this in, you know, the giant's wheel. There's, this is the... Mm -hmm. This is the pattern, right? This is this is what they build. They build these circles, and the same thing in Atlantis, and it's supposedly built by the what we could consider someone a watcher class who, in the Genesis six fashion, sees a uh, sees a human woman and just can't help himself. Mm. So, and he literally builds the city with the canals because of her. I, <laughs> I, I started a band over a broken heart, but I didn't build the city. <laughs> Well, <laughs> metaphorically sp speaking, you built a city, Nate. I did. Took me all over the place. <laughs> so, Doug, are there any blurry creatures associated with Atlantis that you and, know? About? I mean, the the kings of Atlantis would certainly be blurry creatures. Yeah. I mean, they may not have looked like it if if they look like Hercules and Achilles and the and the demigods, and they look like us. They look like uh, big versions of us, like Goliath. But Goliath, yeah. to me, is a blurry creature, isn't he? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, he technically he falls in. I think that's the whole narrative. He's a hybrid. He's a hybrid. He's a hybrid. Yeah. That's how we make sense of all the creatures right. that people talk about on our show. So right. we have to go back there. But it's just like there's so much to learn back there. We we haven't yet come out of there, Luke. We keep staying in that space because it's like there's still so much to learn to 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 try to make sense of the modern day cryptid sightings, you know. So yeah. our blurry creatures is big. What about like, you know, some of the weirder creatures people say like the cyclops that builds st like stonemasons and other Anything other, anything weird mentioned that you've that picked up along the way, or is it just just now with the guard of Atlantis? Not, not that I can think of. No, okay. It's a very, it's a very normal. I mean, Plato's talking about it in very normal terms, which is yeah. You know, that's why people are like, you know, what what in the world is really going on here? It's normal, it's but just, it's not normal, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's the ancient worldview that we're talking about, but it's idealized, but it's not so fantastical that you get you know Bigfoots and. <laughs> all these kinds of stuff right <laughs> yeah that we know of that we, that know, we know of, of. yes doug I, I got an interesting thought as we're as we're talking about this we know that if we're to follow this this train of thought with an incursion and then you have these uh, hybrid offspring again we know that according to the story and the narrative and the oral history and everything else in the written history of plato of atlantis that it was destroyed in a cataclysm and we actually have evidence on the earth for this cataclysm and you'd said it may have been a comet. Is it out of bounds or is it, or is it, is it out of the realm to kind of hypothesize that this second incursion, I just thought of this now, but this second incursion that, that the things that were happening there, that God, God, because he had promised and we know he promised Noah not to destroy the earth by flood again, that this cataclysm was then again, judgment upon, upon this, what this watcher class mm. and, and this city for the de the deprivation that we saw, you know, we see with once again the the DNA wars, the mixing of of angelic um, and and human DNA, and this abomination of creation um, that we see in the Bible as well. But I mean, is there? I just thought of this. I'm like, you know, I know God made His promise, but then we have we do have all this evidence for this major cataclysm. It falls in line with the destruction of Atlantis, and we see it all over the earth because we have the mammoths who said with with food in their bellies and. I don't know. I mean, have you thought about that at all? Or Oh, sure. I mean, just because God says, then I can destroy the whole earth again, doesn't mean he can't destroy parts of it with a flood. And he does that all the time. You know, what's a tsunami, if not destroying something with a flood? Happen all the time. Now, there's little. So, I don't know why you couldn't have... To me, it actually uh, kind of shows that the, that the great flood really needed to be universal and absolutely so catastrophic that we can't even imagine it but you know whether or not I, I still go back and forth and whether or not we're we're talking here about the great flood you know to me what plato says about what we just read with moses seems to put it after that but um there's ways that are that you can get around this catastrophe being 
some being the great flood, it could just have destroyed Atlantis and those people could have scattered. There could have already been things that were, uh, you know, around the world that were destroyed by the earlier flood. Uh, they might have used those. They might have, you know, who knows what they could have done. But there's no reason why the story of Atlantis has to be the great flood. It could just be a great flood. And in fact, Plato begins that way, talking about how the Egyptians say, you guys only remember one flood, but there was a whole lot of floods that came before it. So, well, I, just, I mean, we put, we put it post, you know, post dividing the nations, post Tower of Babel, right? And we know there was a cataclysm. So that's kind of, I was like, wonder if this is, we've seen God do similar things in judging Sodom and Gomorrah, as Nate brought up earlier. So, right. Right. what do you think causes the moment of the cataclysm, Doug? Like, what do they, when do they, when does it get so bad that the cataclysm happens? Because it sounds like these dynasties took a while to build. Oh, yeah. It took a long time to build. Yeah, for so sure. So, why all of a sudden do they just get to a point where they're doing genetic experiments or something? Well, the genetic experiments already began with the kings themselves. So they're like, they're, they're born yeah. into that kind of stuff. And yeah, so it just makes you wonder, like, why, when do you pull the plug and why, you know? You know, it, it's very similar to, I think Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood story are similar in terms of the violence that they both talk about. And also the kind of the sexual confusion and stuff like that that's going on. Um, Plato talks about kind of these great wars that kind of ended the place. It was, it was not... Like I said earlier, the golden age came to an end at some point in time and these people started killing each other and it was brutal. There was, there was big wars between, between Greece and Atlantis, you know? And so I don't know exactly what was going on in Atlantis uh, that would have caused it, but there's no reason to think that it, it would be anything different than what the Sodom story and the flood story tell us. What do you, what do you think is the, is the most likely location? I know you kind of, do you say the Canary Islands or do you buy the Antarctica <laughs> or perhaps that it was somewhere? You, I mean, Doug Van Dorn. Yeah. When I, I mean, here, when what, I read what, these books, I go, man, that's a good <laughs> argument. Man, that's a good argument. And I like, I'm convinced <laughs> with every one of them. So when I try and look at it cumulatively, to me, the one that makes the most sense is that, it, it probably was some kind of an island that was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that was destroyed. And from there, they dispersed. And then they go up to England. They build their mounds. They go over to the Americas. They build their mounds, that kind of stuff. They go down mm -hmm. to South America. They're, you know, these could have been the, the – it's possible that these guys could have been um, uh, the people who built the pyramids. I mean, we just don't know. So I, I personally have no problem. Uh, this is kind of a, you know – uh, genealogy thing, but I have no problem with there being gaps in genealogies, biblical genealogies that could be long, long periods of time. So to me, the Tower of Babel could have been 11,000 years ago. The flood could have been that long ago. I, I just don't care. Like the purpose of the flood or sorry, the purpose of the genealogies is to connect modern history with the ancient history. That's their only function. And they do it in a theological way through numbers and through a perfect set of generations. So they don't have to tell you every single generation that came along. They only have to link it together genealogically for you to realize that, that there's a, there's a connection through time so that, so that the myths actually are historical. If that makes sense. Mm. Hmm. It's like a highlight reel, right? Yeah. Like we're not going to give you everything, but we're going to give you the highlights. Exactly. Here. I mean, you got 11 chapters to tell everything that happened on the earth for the first 4,000 years, even if you take it literally. And then the rest of the Bible is the last two thousand. I mean, come on, they're they're yeah. definitely skipping a lot of a lot of things. Right. Was that covered? Was that covered in like apocryphal books and things that didn't make it into the Bible? Just like more history. Oh, well, they're definitely traditions. Like you'll find uh, in pseudepigrapha, you'll find I forget what book this is, but they talk about how the giants built the Tower of Babel. Hmm. Hmm. So to them. The, the giants were already here when the Tower of Babel thing happened. So why do you think Atlantis is like, of all the ancient civilizations, one of the most popular, the most talked about? Is, was there something special about it? So I think that it, it captures the imagination of humanity in a way that n almost nothing else can. And to me, it, it's both a backwards thing and a forward thing. Uh, what I mean by that is read, my reading of what happened before the flood is very similar to what I think Plato's talking about in terms of a golden age. It took a long time for God to end up destroying the, the first you know, group of humans the way that he did. And uh, everybody talks about this kind of a golden age. And what's funny is that we all talk about a golden age in the future as well. 
whether or not uh, you know you believe in a future millennium or you just think that that's the end you know the end of all things in the eternal state it's the same thing at the end of the day that there's a golden age there's a there's peace there's prosperity there's all the things that we want the things that even communism wants but they can't have because they try and do it in a fallen state with wicked people and that just isn't going to work i think that it captures our imagination and then and then you get the mystery of it like where is it what happened is this real you know all these questions that make you just want to go digging so it's yeah. the perfect storm of some kind of an exciting prehistoric thing and the fact that you've got a major philosopher you know one of the top three philosophers in the history of earth writing very serious stuff about it for two whole books that that goes a long ways too this isn't just you know madame blavatsky talking about you know her <laughs> her vision that she had <laughs> yeah, or edward or edward yeah, casey, edward casey. Yeah. i mean those guys yeah. are both big atlantean people why bring them up but uh, this is plato well, it, we're talking about yeah maybe maybe because it's so like if it was just some dynasty in the middle of uh, middle of land somewhere, it doesn't have that romantic feel to it. But it's like this island, and it's there's this circles. It's like a pot of gold that sank to the bottom of the totally. ocean. Totally, yeah. It's like it's it's got that romantic part to it, right? And it's also got uh, it's got an ability to kind of help us make sense of all the megalithic stuff that we see around the world. Mm-hmm. Like you can put that into the Atlantis story and and start to say, yeah, okay, I can kind of make sense of how that could have happened. Whereas I yeah. think without Atlantis as a, as a referent, you're in a lot more trouble trying to figure out what was going on. How could this have happened? Yeah, I just I, I get this vision, Luke, that it's like the cantina in Star Wars. There's like this cool bar that you walk into Atlantis and there's all these creatures everywhere. And <laughs> Han Solo's making a deal. Um, these, these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> but there's all these creatures there probably. I mean, do you, do you, do you subscribe to the idea that like some of these dynasties, if we could go back and just walk around for a couple days, we would just be absolutely stunned at some of the stuff we would see and the creatures we would see and the beings we would see. Or do you think it was just pretty just giants and, and, and then humans kind of interacting or what do you envision it to be like, look like in your mind? I guess I've always envisioned it kind of more normally, but as it, just as you ask the question and you think about it and you think about what is the origin of a demon? Well, okay. So it's a Nephilim, you know, where these guys doing things, you know, that we know from other places uh, with animals and stuff. Yeah. Those are, those are demonic creatures too, you know, sirens and centaurs and minotaurs, all those kinds of things. Why not? They had to have been, I, I would think, I mean, we don't know, especially with the, with the animal hybrid stuff. We don't, we don't have proof that those things existed physically. So they could just be spiritual entities that were created in that realm in the first place. But I don't know. That's not the way the myths talk about them. Hmm. Hmm. I just think that whenever I hear stories, I paint, start painting a picture in my mind. And if you've read 30 books on Atlantis, there's got to be a great visual in there. Kind of some sort of like, you know, water kingdom. Probably be a pretty fast, fascinating place to walk around for a couple of days, I think. So you think it just hit, gets hit by a comet, sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and what's the evidence of that? How do we, how can we say there's evidence that suggests that that's the end of Atlantis? Yeah, so this is definitely not my area of expertise, but okay. like I said, I you could go to um, Randall Carlson's podcast, and he like he did ten shows on on the uh, geological. Um, and oh, wow. catastrophic evidence that that science has independently of any kind of Atlantis theory that just so happens to fit exactly the time frame and the place uh, that's the most popular theory for where Atlantis would have been. Like it's real evidence. It's not. It's not a joke. It it really was. It, it's uh, you know, the the land that is now three thousand feet under the ocean was created above water. Hmm. How, how does that happen? And it was created above water recently. How does that happen? Well, there, so that at the very place where the Canary Islands come together, there's actually three continental uh, plates that come together, three tectonic plates right in the plate. So it creates like the, one of the greatest weakness, uh, weak spots on the crustal face of the earth. Hmm. That if something was to hit that, it would be absolutely devastating. And, 
you know, I'm, I'm a believer that these kinds of things rise and fall uh, great amounts of heights in very quick spans of time. You guys have surely seen the, uh, the big rift, the Atlantic, mid-Atlantic rift that you can see in pictures that looks like a giant yeah. zipper that goes right down yeah. the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? So this is, uh, I think, just to the east of where that is. And, and um, I mean, something, without a doubt, something terrible happened there. That's why, to me, it, it looks like you could have had the Great Flood um, that would have created that first rift, and then you could have had an island that would have been there after that and then that could have been destroyed in you know, by volcano by comet by whatever man yeah i mean if you you see that if you ever seen the the mid atlantic rift in the in in iceland it's it's a great it's a great a great spot above land where you can look at that mm. how those things come together and and move and and the idea that you could have i mean think about it, if you have an impact and we, we we hypothesize it's a comet and there's an impact like that that causes these plates to move. It's not out of the realm, I'm sure, as as you say, Randall Carlson talks about, of of something having a, a drastic and very real fall, you know, literal fall from from to the to the bottom of the ocean. I just there's like have you guys ever heard that, of a guy named Emmanuel Velikovsky? I've not. This dude wrote uh, back back in the fifties. He was he was a really popular writer for about ten years, and you know most scientists can't stand him, but he he had this theory that. Um, Basically, the whole Peruvian plateau that's now two miles above water, and it goes down into Bolivia where you've got Lake Titicaca, which is uh, basically the highest uh, freshwater lake in the world. Absolutely giant mm-hmm. thing. And there's like there's like seaports by it. Hmm. Why would you have seaports in the middle of something that's t- you know two miles up in the air, three miles up in the air? It doesn't make any sense. So he suggests that the whole Andes mountain plain was created basically overnight. You know, whether or not this is the same event or a different event, it doesn't matter. It's the idea that that some you know these terrible catastrophes do absolutely unimaginable rapid changes to the surface of the earth. Carlson does the same kind of stuff over in I I think they're called the Scablands over in um, Eastern Washington State, where you have this. Uh, Mizzou, lake missoula ancient lake glacial missoula that that would uh fill up with water and then it would spill over and then fill up with water and spill over and every time it does this it creates these incredible you know pox scars all over the land that are unimaginable you can stand there and you're like there's no way this could happen i think that's probably what happened with uh the grand canyon myself i think that it was probably dammed up above you know it's lake ancient lake colorado and that at some point in time after the flood, there was so much water that had been built up higher than it that that w- there was one point that just kind of gave way and the Grand Canyon was created overnight. Hmm. Not by the flood itself, but after the flood, you know, because the pressure of these lakes, you can't even comprehend how much water and force there is. Sure, as the water, the water recedes, then you have... Yeah, it's gotta and so those are ideas right. of many floods right there. I mean, you got a flood that destroys... You know, the four corners of Colorado and you got the flood that destroys eastern uh, Washington state. Those aren't the global floods, but they're. I wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> but what? So so what about Atlantis, though, like at its the stories that kept you coming back and buying more and more books? Part of like, it was that uh, everybody kept giving a different opinion for where it was. And I wanted to find out, like. Does anybody really know? Can anybody say for sure? And out of reading all those, I kind of came to the conclusion that no, nobody knows for sure where it was. There are a couple of guesses that are better than others, but kind of the the thesis of Hancock that I liked so much that there was a global civilization that was destroyed. The idea that Atlantis was in all these different places fits with that idea. Hmm. That they were all, it's not that they were all Atlantis. There was only one Atlantis and it was somewhere. But these places were destroyed all over the earth. So in some ways, to me, Atlantis, even though even though I'm saying, you know, I think that it was half after the Tower of Babel. Now, I hadn't really formulated that until way later on. And, and it was really a the flood story that was kind of fueling my desire to know more about Atlantis. Because 
you know, in my mind, it was, you know, was this, was this the ancient world told from a Greek point of view uh, that we have, you know, going on in Genesis 4 and 5 with Cain and, and the sons of Seth and all that kind of stuff? Is that what was going on? Hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I've always been, I've always been one to sit, to kind of assume that the biblical story is true, uh, and not to doubt it. And to say that if I don't understand it, that's my problem and not its problem. And so the Atlantis thing kind of helps me fill in some gaps in different, you know, over the course of the years in different ways than I thought that it would. But nevertheless, it speaks to both the flood and the Tower of Babel, I think. Fascinating. It, 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 it really is. Yeah. It, it, so it sounds like there are dynasties that were destroyed altogether in one cataclysm, major cataclysm, cataclysm and then there's individual events too like comets or earthquakes or other things and and as this show's kind of gone on luke like it 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 feels like god gets involved when there's genetic tampering (laughs) like and 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 rob skiba said this on our show i think luke about specifically chimeras remember that was his idea that once we were putting animal and human dna together that's when god was the most angry i don't know that was kind of that sounded like his theory. What do you think about that, Doug? Like, does that make sense? Because he said after the flood, that's what he think the majority of the problem was. But I don't know. I mean, as soon as you talk about that, I'm I'm I totally agree with that. Um, but my mind goes to the present day. I, I just can't help it because I know right? the kinds of things that we're doing. Yeah, uh, along this these lines, genetic tampering. I mean, we're doing it with the vaccine. We're doing it with, uh, we're doing it with animals themselves. We're doing it with all kinds of things that we actually have laws against. We're doing it. Mm-hmm. And how can God put up with that? And I don't think that we've been doing it for the last 2000 years. Like this is a new thing recently speaking, but in the ancient world, I think that they were doing it, whether or not they had watch or help or they were doing it a completely different, you know, scientific way than anything we've ever thought of. They were doing it. And it's good, real. All the stories say the same thing. They were doing that, and this is the new. This is a new old thing. This right? is a new old thing, like, and and uh, yeah. God made things after their kind, and He doesn't like us messing with that. Yeah, that's that's kind of the vibe I've gotten on our show. Is that you know, it's like Vegas can kind of barrel on until it does something. It starts doing things. It, it, like God has this, in, you know, crazy patience. You know, even in the days of Noah, one hundred twenty years took them to build the boat before they were already in trouble. We need to build right. a boat, but we'll give you another 120 years right. to figure, figure your crap out. Right. Um, <laughs> but it seems like there's just a, there's, there's finally a limit. And I think, you know, if we consider these things abominations, once you start creating abominations, like, all right, I've had enough of you. And it is, it is sad because we are, we get those links all the time from people who listen to our show, like the monkey, the chimeras they're making in, China and mm-hmm. J- Japan and it's in like, here. Okay. <laughs> Montauk, yeah. New Jersey. Come on. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Str- and, and the deer ba- the deer babies on Netflix. They're doing them all. <laughs> yeah. So there was there. I, I think there were, had to have been some chimerical creatures being created there and, it, and that sort of sets it off. Um, that's my thought anyway. There you go, Nate. Yep. But how they the, do it. I mean, the they son, can, the sons of Poseidon, we're making mermen and mermaids. It's a perfect place for it. Yeah, it's just something about that that soup. When you make that soup, you get in trouble. Yep. Are some of these dynasties like Atlantis and Gobekli Tepe, like, are they sort of a precursor of what's com- coming back? Some sort of Atlantis? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, so you just remind me of it. What I find so interesting about so much uh, Atlantology, it's like paganism and cults just flock to it. And why in the world would that be? So you've got definite kind of demonology going on with Blavatsky and Casey. I mean, they're, you know, going into trances and seances and all this stuff to get this information about what happened. All right. So that, that right there tells you that something is probably going on. I don't, you know, you can, you can say it's all a bunch of hooey, but you can say that it's real too. And that what it is is demonic, satanic. So there's something about Atlantis that even though it's like a golden age and it's a utopia, it's also really, it's in some ways, it's the embodiment of what Babel is. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. 
And, uh, you know, maybe that's why a lot of Christians stay away from it, which is perfectly fine to do. But just the idea that this is what theophysists talk about all the time. Why would that be? And what does that mean Atlantis really is? And then you put that into the future. And if this is what, you know, if, if this is a vision that people have for where we're going as a planet and as a species, we kind of want to go back to that idea. Well, I think you can be prepared for God to say, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't know how far he'll let us go, but. Is it, you're saying it's almost like a precursor for the Antichrist, right? It's this idea they can create this, this utopia outside of the need or, or or the want of God, right? And this, there's this whole it's this whole counterfeiting of of Eden. It feels like, yeah, it's this counter it's this counterfeit of Eden. Yeah, and uh, you know this is going to usher in kind of the final battle, sort of a thing of of Revelation twenty and Gog and Magog and all that. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting that we've had so much more information about Atlantis in the last you know forty years than we had in the first twenty five hundred years of hearing about the story. Of course, that's that way with a lot of things, but um, sure, it feels like a quickening, right? I mean, it feels like it does. A, yeah, it's a ramping yeah. up in so many different ways. Yeah. And of course, we're never we're, we've never been more connected, right? So that there's yeah. the there's a sharing of information, yeah. but at the same time, it's like the interest is very very interesting. Well, a lot of people on our show describe sort of like it's going to get really, 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 really bad, and the great deception will be something really great. This dynasty, this new, it's not just going to be bad forever. Like the deception is this twisted version of what, like a great society like we've finally arrived right and then everyone upgrades to this godlike state you know and it feels like the the new atlantis the new atlantis yep so that's kind of why i asked the question because it seems like we're everything's getting so bad and so terrible and everything's just everything sucks and everything everyone you know disease and and, and wars and all this crap and then the new Atlantis shows up, right? That's exactly right. I mean, actually, uh, I have one book that talks about that kind of a thing as well. A couple of famous scientists in the 1600s were basically devoting their entire lives to kind of bringing back Atlantis, the new Atlantis. And it's right up the same alley with this cult stuff and the Gnosticism and all that kind of stuff at secret societies. I mean, all mm -hmm. that, it just, it just perfectly blends into this whole story. And yeah. I don't, I don't know if Plato even uh, meant for that to happen or not. Which is another reason why it's so interesting to me. Like, why, why? I don't, I, I read Plato and I go, I don't get, I don't get that. But you know, just talking out loud, it does make a lot of sense. Just given who Poseidon was, who his children were, you know, why it was destroyed, all that. Yeah, it seems like on this show, the more we learn that these symbols have been creeping up over and over and over and over again and that history repeats itself and the devil can't help but leave his calling card. You know what I mean? In the past and in the present and what's to come. And, and he very much uses the same tools and the same symbols and everything else. So it makes sense to me that like whatever happened then is going to happen again. And it seems like society is just barreling towards something, some sort of, major announcement some yeah. kind of event for sure yeah sure yeah so read read your bibles read revelation we know what's coming <laughs> the problem is you know people read it but they don't have any context in which to make sense of it right like sure they don't they don't they don't know the alternate history like what really happened how do you make sense of these categories i don't know just feels like a big a big tapestry of stories but there's so many themes and if you step back I, I i'm i'm a big picture person i like the connections i like to draw the lines and connect the dots so it's hard to get down to the nitty-gritty of something but it's easy to kind of go what where's i'll give i'll give you one more i've been i've been playing with this the last week or so it's related to the to the whole atlantis thing mm -hmm. um in terms of what are called platonic ages or platonic months and uh, so Anybody worth his salt writing about Atlantis will talk about what's called the great year. Mm. The great year is the time it takes for basically. So like if you went out on the, on the equinox and you looked up at the sky and you looked and you measured where a star was rising, right where the sun comes up. Okay. And then you did this every equinox every year, um, consistently faithfully. What you find is that it doesn't keep rising in the same place. It changes ever so slightly. 
So after 72 years, you've moved one degree around what's called the ecliptic, which is the center line where all those, uh, the 12 signs of the zodiac revolve. Okay. So it takes about 20, almost 26,000 years for it to make one revolution because the earth is like a top that's wobbling over and it, and its north pole changes ever so slightly. So that's what causes this to happen. So the procession is the, the procession, procession of the equinoxes, equinoxes, right? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Have you guys talked yeah. about it on the show? No, no. Yeah. So this, this is, is really interesting because, um, the procession is related, uh, to Atlantis in terms of when it was, seems to have been destroyed. So there seems to have been some kind of a, I forget which, which one of the movements into which sign it was, but you know, you go back 11,500 years and you find that you move from one platonic month into the next. So a month is basically 2,100 years, roughly speaking, when it moves from uh, one constellation into the next. So it's a 30 degree change around the, the 360 degree circle. And so you've heard the song, you guys are, you guys are, you got to be old enough to know the song. Age of Aquarius. Aquarius right? I know where you're going, yeah. Doug. Age I know where Aquarius. you're going with this. Okay. Yeah. The age of Aquarius is this idea that we've been in the age of Pisces basically since interesting Jesus came around and Jesus, uh, his people were, he said, he's going to make you fishers of men. And um, the Christians called themselves little fishes. They greeted each other with the sign of the fish. If you could mark, you know, the other side of the sign of the fish, then they would know you were a Christian. Baptismals were actually called fish ponds. I just learned that in the last week. Why is that? It's because, because the ancient people, they understood procession and they understood that they had moved into the age of Pisces. So what's interesting is the age of Pisces comes to an end and we've either left it or we're right at the end of it hmm. and pisces is the 12th sign of of uh i think it's the day calendar of when the sun is moving through the through the cycles over the day so that would put you the way, I, the way i'm thinking about it is it would put you when jesus was born at about december 1st on the calendar of the great year and right now we're at about december 30th or 31st <laughs> before we move into the brand new uh, cycle going back right. to the age of Aquarius, the age of man. And so I've wondered like this idea of a millennium, uh, in revelation 20, could that be in some way, a way to reference these platonic months, this long period of time between these ages and that the present age, this age of Pisces, when it comes to an end, like that's the culmination of all things. And then you've got, you got the battle and then you got the eternal state. That's the way I look at it. If that's true, it was totally speculative, but I find mm -hmm. it really interesting that it, it would, it would follow after the pattern of Atlantis. Um, it would follow after the very same things we're talking about in terms of war and genetic manipulation. Mm -hmm. And it would also help us make sense of the, you know, the crazy unprecedented worldwide things that are, that have been happening in, you know, recent years and especially in the last few years. Hmm. So it's fascinating though, because we are at, literally and astronomically at the end of the yeah, age. Yeah, we are. We are at the end of the age. Very, very, very really and truly. Man. I don't know what to do with that, but I find it really interesting. And I mean, I'm as conservative as you get when it comes to eschatology. So I've been preaching revelation and I'm not a big great tribulation guy and a rapture guy. And yet, I, I kind of come to some of the same ideas a totally different way. I'm just kicking it around and trying to make sense of the world that's around us. And hmm. uh, man, Atlantis might actually help you do that. That's kind of a weird thought. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the keys to unlock it, right? right? <laughs> well, I mean, you we, we awesome. think about that a lot on well, our Doug. show is just like how so much foreshadowing and so much you know throughout the story of the Old Testament that you know there was going to be one that would come and crush the head. You know, and I, the serpent, yeah. and I think there was so many, it, you know, it, like I was thinking, you know, I was talking today about the story of Hosea, um, and how he was commanded to marry a prostitute. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but the symbolism is, is that like, you know, God's chosen people are constantly committing adultery, you know, and there's the story, but then there's the bigger story. There's the, there's the broader symbolism and picture of what it's depicting and i think that's the hard part about when you're so like day to day you can't see the bigger picture of what's going on and how this all you know our lives are so short so we 
You know, we think 120 years of the ark just to close the door, right? That's longer than any of us are going to live. So right. it's it, it's just so it's so slow to us. But when you when you speed it up, so much takes place over the thousands of years that sometimes you need to look at the thousands of years to actually go, oh, okay. Now I get what the, now I get what's going on. But anyway, Doug, fascinating. Thanks so much for coming on. And I don't know if you have any last thoughts on Atlantis, but um, if there's a book you recommend, people like if you got to read this one, or or you can tell them read your book or whatever you want to do. Yeah, like, I got no books on Atlantis. Uh, I always <laughs> always read the giant book for fun, but uh, that's yeah, not yeah. Atlantis. But. Um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting books on it. I don't know that I could recommend one or not. Unfortunately, like I said, there's no real Christians that are writing about it. So you have to you have to be careful about how you're interpreting the information. Mm-hmm. But um, for fiction, man, go read Stephen Lawhead's Taliesin and the Arthur story because it's fantastic. And at least that's he's a, he's at least he's a Christian. But uh, you know, like I said, I got started with Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods book, and that can take anybody down lots of different roads and hopefully Judd will have his book out on go do go Beckley Tepe sometime soon. And yeah, that's certainly related to this. Yeah. Doug, what are you, are you working on anything right now? What do you got going on? What are you cooking? Oh man, I've been, I've been preaching through revelation. So it's been just brutal. I haven't been writing anything else. I'm just trying to figure out what that book's about. Hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a whole, our, our friend Hi- Michael Heiser has a uh, yeah. He's been working on an entire it, an entire podcast. He's behind me, so I can't it. go listen to him talk about what's <laughs> not been done yet. <laughs> oh, I love it. Love well, it, Doug. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks. And you look good in that shirt. You look great in that it's shirt. Pretty good shirt. I kind of like it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll send you another one when you wear that one out. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> if you, if you, go, you cut the sleeves off the other one if you want. <laughs> you know, if you it's go a good yard work shirt. I'm too old. I don't know. If you want to see that. <laughs> have, you, have you spotted Bigfoot in the Colorado mountains yet, or what? No, but uh, oh man, you wear that you. shirt, you might. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thanks, Doug. We uh, as always, we appreciate you and your time. Yeah, man. Thanks, thanks for having me on, guys. All right, all right.